Hello and welcome to the Claret and Blue podcast. I know that you've clicked on this expecting to see Martin Larson. I will get out of your hair very soon. I just wanted to say a big thank you for everyone who's tuning into our content at the moment. We've also recently switched our audio hosting platform to Global, which means you can now find us on the Global Player app, where you'll be able to listen to our podcast before anywhere else. However, if you do listen on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or even you're watching on YouTube, that won't change. It's just that we're now available in an additional place. So if you want to go and download the app, you can do so by clicking the link in the description. Obviously, we're all in lockdown at the moment and Martin Larson happens to live in Spain now, which is new information to me. I always thought he was in Denmark for some reason, but that obviously means that we're speaking to him over Skype. So there is a few little connection issues and things like that. The quality isn't the, the usual standard that we would usually strive for. However, it's probably better to have lower quality, higher quality content than high quality waffle from me, Matt and James. So. If anything, it's probably a good thing. Thank you very much for sticking with us and uh, enjoy the episode. I was I was happy with everything. I just wanted to leave AC Milan and come to, to Aston Villa and play in, in the Premier League. To do a training session on the Monday, on the Tuesday, I had to take painkillers. And that was where I thought that, okay, no, this is, this is not right. Aston Villa for me is my club. You know, that's, uh, that's where I have my heart. But I remember after that meeting at the Villa Park that I was, uh, I was in shock. I cried a bit as well, I remember. Martin O'Neill was uh, a, great, a great leader in the sense that, um, that he, he was a winner. When he was at his best, John Carew, he was unstoppable. It must have been very difficult for, uh, for the other defenders that played against him. I was in the shape of my life uh, when I had to stop. I played the best football of my career, so that was that was what made me sad. If I start doing something here, if I start to to prepare, I would obviously consider Aston Villa if uh, if they needed me someday. Right, Martin, uh, can we kick off? It's a bit of a bit of a strange question to start with, but how do you actually pronounce your name? Is it Lawson? Is it Lawson? How, how do you say it? Well, I think it's uh, it's different from uh, if uh, if an English guy pronounces it or a Danish guy pronounces it or Swedish, whatever. But uh, in Denmark, you say Martin Lawson. 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 But in in English, I mean, it's Martin Lawson. That's that's fine. I'm glad we've glad we've cleared that one up. What what I wanted to start with, I wanted to take you take you back a, a long, long way to when you were a young boy growing up in Denmark, because I don't think I've ever heard the story about what it was like the first time you kicked a ball, whether you come from a sporting family. So, could you just give us a little bit of a flavour of how you first got into football, please? Well, uh, I started to play football when I was six years old, together with my little brother who's five, uh, and we we. Uh, lived in a small city in, uh, in Denmark, uh, very small, only 1,000 uh, people lived there and still lives there. Um, and uh, we started pl- playing football together with my dad uh, as a coach. Uh, at that time, uh, me and my brother, we were together every second year. So uh, when I was the, the oldest one, I was playing with, with him. And when I was the youngest one, uh, I played with, uh, you know, guys that were one year older than me and my father always followed my little brother so I had my father as a coach uh, every second year and and it was like that uh, until I was 14 perhaps so I had my dad uh, as a coach for yeah Eight years, perhaps. And when when you were when you were first starting out as a as a footballer, then or as a young footballer, were you always a defender back then? No, no, no. I've uh, I've been a striker for for my for many years. It was only when when I got uh, when I started to to study in a, in a bigger city, and I started on uh, on, a, on a, a kind of college a football college. Um, that was at that age where I was sixteen. Uh, so I've been a striker until I was uh, 16 years old, or a uh, right, right winger. Um, but the story is that we were uh, at this tournament in uh, in Holland uh, when I was uh, when I was around 16, 17 years old. And after the first game in Holland, the coach asked me if I could play as a centre half because the centre half got injured or something happened. 
and we were short of uh, of center halves. And uh, I said, yes, okay, I can try that. Uh, and it went really well. And uh, and from that day, I've always been a centre half. So, what what were you like as a striker? Then, who would you who would you liken yourself to in the professional game? I was I was quick, you know, I was quick and uh, a pretty good um, header of a ball. Uh, and um, and then I then I worked hard, uh, but it was it was most of all uh, because I was quick that I scored some goals. At what age were you when you when you kind of realised that you, you had a good chance of, of being a professional footballer? I was probably uh, around uh, eighteen uh, because I I got out of school uh, in ninety seven. That was uh, I was nineteen because I signed my first contract uh, half a year before I I um, stopped uh, in school. Uh, so I was I was 19 years old, and uh, before that, before that, I wouldn't say that that uh, that I had a chance of becoming a footballer. It, it, the 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 nice story is actually that in my team there were seven players uh, together with some other players uh, from the the uh, older team and the senior team that uh, that were selected to train together, and uh, I was not. Among those seven players, you know, the seven best players. Uh, and that uh, I was very sad about, but um, that kicked me off a bit as well. Because I thought it was wrong of the of the coach not to select me in that group. Uh, um, but uh, it, it turned me on a bit. I mean, I, I wanted to prove him wrong. And um, I was, I was, I, I would say I was 18 at that point. Uh, but then I stopped. I stopped um, in school, and I got to uh, to train full time with the senior squad. In the spring of '98, uh, it really it really went well for me. Uh, I was I was well prepared for um, for the campaign, uh, and I was in good shape, and I played really well that that spring, uh, that first half of the season. Uh, and then I got sold in, in 98, but it's, it was very quick, everything. It wasn't like I was, uh, I, you know, I was a big, big, uh, talent, uh, you, you know, somebody that always said, you're going to be a professional. Uh, also because I was, I was playing in my small town, my small club until I was 16 and I was a striker and I went to silver ball as a striker. And then it went, it went really quick at, uh, at, uh, at the time. Um, so it was only after half a year playing with the first team that, uh, that, that I could see, you know, this is uh, probably, this is good. <laughs> I can perhaps be, become a professional footballer. So what, what jobs did, you, did your parents do then, Martin? Do you come from a sporting background at all? Oh yeah, but uh, my, my dad has always played football. And uh, like I said, he's been my coach. Uh, for for some years uh, in the beginning, uh, he likes football as well. My mother knows she she played a bit of handball, um, but my 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 brother and I we've always been very much interested in in sport. I've played uh, badminton, table tennis, uh, tennis as well. Uh, always always uh, was very interested in in sport, um, but football when I become when I was 16 was the most important thing. So what do you think you would have done for a job if you hadn't have been a footballer? I would probably have been uh, a teacher, uh, a school teacher or like uh, like kindergarten teacher for, for small kids. I've always liked to work with, uh, with kids. Um, probably have done something like that. But I've never had, I've never had uh, like a, an honest job, a normal, normal job, <laughs> you know. So, so, uh, so I don't know. I've all, I, I've only had some summer jobs, uh, worked a bit, uh, you know, when when I couldn't play football. But uh, like I said, I stopped, you know, in school and was straight from there, uh, a professional footballer. Let's leap forward quite a way to when you when you joined Aston Villa. Can I ask what were your what were your first impressions? It would have been Doug Ellis and David O'Leary, wouldn't it? Back yeah. then, what were your what were your first impressions of Mr. Ellis? First of all, old man, uh, <laughs> pretty tight with uh, his money. <laughs> it was a good impression. It was it was fine uh, for me. It it wasn't important if it was uh, him or some somebody else. Uh, I just wanted to leave AC Milan 
I wanted to come to Aston Villa. Uh, I obviously wanted a, a, a good contract, but that was up to, to my agent. First of all, I wanted to come to Premier League. After some conversation with uh, O'Leary and uh, after I saw the stadium, the training ground, it wasn't the old, uh, it wasn't the new training ground, it was the old training ground, but still it was fine for me. I was I was happy with everything. I just wanted to leave AC Milan and come to to Aston Villa and play in in the Premier League. So, whatever uh, chairman, uh, but he was he was fine, not a problem. Can you remember where where, where your agent and, and yourself first met Villa's management team? Did they take you somewhere? Did they take you for a meal, or did they invite you to the the stadium, or, or what was it? Yeah, we went uh, we went straight to uh, to the stadium and. Um, and uh, saw the stadium together and uh, actually I was and then we went up to his uh, to his office uh, in the stadium uh, and and I was there as well um, I think it was the chairman uh, Ellis that uh, that said that it was the first time that a player was in there you know negotiating the contract with the agent he's never tried that before but I I, I, I wanted to be there and uh, we had a talk with uh, Doug Ellis uh, there at the stadium, and um, it wasn't a problem. Um, he he said something I, I, uh, that was fine, or we agreed something, whatever. But uh, it was it wasn't uh, it wasn't a difficult uh, negotiation. It was um, it was pretty straight on and uh, and fine for everyone. Can you remember the first Aston Villa player you met after signing for the club? And and, can, and as part of that question, who became your best friend amongst the players? To be honest, I can't remember the first player that that I met, but I remember that we went to the training ground after, and I I went around and and said hello to uh, to the staff and to everyone working there, and probably also met some of the players, but I can't remember. Uh, but my best friend uh, obviously become or you know, became. Uh, Olaf Melberg. He's he's from Sweden. I couldn't understand him in the in the beginning. And uh, and Thomas Sorensen, who's who's been training with uh, and playing with Swedish people uh, for many years, he was he couldn't understand that I couldn't understand Olaf because he thought it was so easy. But I've never spoken to Swedish people before in my life, and I thought it was impossible to understand. But Olaf became my my very good friend because I got. Divorced uh, while I was in uh, in Aston Villa, I had a I had a half Italian, half Danish girlfriend. Wife became my wife, uh, but I got divorced, and I was uh, by myself for uh, a year before I met my wife, um, who's from Sweden actually. So now I'm, I understand Swedish well, <laughs> but I, I I came very much um, in Olaf's house uh, together with. Uh, his wife, uh, uh, Carolina, and their uh, two kids, and uh, I was very, very much uh, with with them. And uh, Olaf and I, we we become became very good friends, uh, and are still good friends um, that that day today. That's really interesting. You're saying about Olaf helping you through kind of a difficult time in, in your personal life, because we just imagine that that footballers have a kick around, you know, on on a Saturday train together, and then just kind of it's all kind of lad and banter rather than actually you know supporting each other so those kind of friendships last last a lifetime don't they martin definitely definitely it was uh, it was you know we had the same humor we we clicked we clicked uh, together uh, me and olaf and spent uh, a lot of time uh, always when we played together uh, in the dressing room after the dressing room because like you say normally normally i don't think you you become you come be, you become friends with some of the players, but but I was I was practically in their house, uh, you know, from from when we finished training, we had lunch together, and then I came to their house. Sometimes I had dinner at their house. Sometimes I slept there. Sometimes I went home, but I was very very much in their house, and they meant a lot to me. Uh, still do. Um, so he was a big help. Uh, the, the wife as well, Carolina, was a big help uh, for me in that pretty p- uh, tough period uh, of time. You know, uh, divorce is, is never nice, even though we were both happy that it ended. Uh, that's another, st- another story, but but everything went well, went well uh, after that. Did Olaf introduce you to, to your new wife? Yes, it's uh, it's Olaf's uh, wife's cousin. Uh, I'm uh, I'm married to uh, that day today, so 
that's a that's a nice uh, story as well. Uh, best best friends, uh, Carolina and and Mia uh, is my wife's name, uh, and cousins. Uh, they've known each other for their whole life, and um, yeah, the story is that Mia came over uh, uh, to to see Carolina, and uh, obviously I was I was there, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, we uh, we became. Uh, uh, we were in love <laughs> pretty much from uh, from day one. <laughs> I didn't think we were going to get a romantic love story today, but I, uh, I appreciate that. Can I ask, when you first moved to Villa, what was the medical like, Martin? Were, were there any, I mean, we'll get onto your injuries in a moment, but were there any signs of injury when you joined Villa or did that come later? I've had some problems with my knee before that, uh, when I was at uh, in Verona, but I played three years in AC Milan without having uh, any problems. So it went, it went, uh, it wasn't a problem. It was, it, it was straight, straight ahead. Uh, but then the problem started when um, O'Leary and his staff, uh, staff wanted to uh, do some heavy weights uh, for, for my legs. Uh, and that was probably good for some players, but my knee wasn't good at that point. It was it was fine, but it, I couldn't do all that heavy weight training for my legs. Uh, my knee wasn't strong enough uh, for that, and that was what that was what happened. You know uh, that uh, I got a, I got a bad knee after that. I I, I shouldn't have done that, uh, but I wasn't I wasn't strong enough uh, to say no. I can't do that because I just wanted to do what what they say, and I was uh, very humble you know uh, when i came to aston villa i didn't want to create any problems didn't want to say that i couldn't do that i couldn't do this and so i i did even though i thought probably this is not so good for my knee i remember i thought but still i did it uh, but um uh, looking back looking back it was uh, obviously wrong and that was what uh, that was what kick started my my knee problems uh, in the first period of time at Aston Villa. What were they trying to achieve with these extra kind of knee weights then, Martin? What, surely you, you're a big, strong, athletic guy anyway. What, what, what were they trying to bring to your game that you, did, you didn't already have? Some, um, some power. I think they wanted to, to, to bring some power. I think weights for the legs are fine. Uh, and like I said, some, for some players, it was probably okay but uh, for me, it was too much. Uh, it was like you, you had a lot of weights on your shoulders and, and on that machine and you, you bend it down and had to push up quickly to put some power into your legs. It was a little bit old fashioned, uh, even though it was so many years ago, you could have done other things for your legs that wasn't so hard. But for me, it didn't, it, it, it wasn't good, but that was, that was what happened. It was, it was those heavy weights that I had to lift up, uh, bend my knees and, uh, and then lift up, but it, it was too hard for me. So tell us, uh, I understand that you had to take painkillers or painkilling injections to play on a Saturday. What's that like? You know, kind of, what does it do? Does it just numb you, numb you so you've got no feeling? And then what are the after effects of that, Martin? Uh, no, I didn't. I, I always only took uh, pills. I, I've never had injections uh, to 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 play a match. Uh, but but it's quite it's quite normal that football players they can take a painkiller uh, before the game. You don't have to, and uh, and there are many players that doesn't that don't do that. But some some I know some some players they can take a painkiller to uh, not because they have big problems, but they can. Like Beresi, I said, I've heard Beresi, Franco Beresi said, you know, you always have a little bit of uh, discomfort, a little bit pain there, or whatever, but you can play a match. And for me, it was the same. I could take a painkiller. But the, the real problem came when, when I played the match and when I came to train Monday morning, it was very sore still, very painful. And to, to make, to do a training session on the Monday, on the Tuesday, I had to take painkillers. And that was where I thought that, okay, no, this is this is not right. I, I don't know. I, I, there were probably somebody from before that uh, that said to me that you can take a painkiller for the match, but you have to be able to train without any problems, without taking anything. Otherwise, you have a problem. Uh, and that was what uh, that was what happened. And that was when I said, 
okay, stop. Now now I have a big problem with my knee. I have to take care of this. I cannot train. The problem with, uh, with David O'Leary that he couldn't uh, understand uh, the situation. He didn't think that I could that I could, uh, you know, come through this. And I was pretty important for the team. I was playing. And when I played, I played well. Uh, and the, and the, the team wasn't doing so well. So it, is, it was important for David O'Leary that I played. He didn't think about my situation. So I heard from the doctor afterwards, afterwards that, that he, he said more or less, let's, let's make him play half a year. And then he will break down, but okay, he's, he's played half a year and that's fine. So I was, I was very close of, uh, you know, ending my career if I, if I had followed him. But because I was pretty old, pretty experienced, I could say, okay, stop. Now I cannot do this. But, but I had some discussions with, uh, with the doctor and, uh, O'Leary and, uh, and some of the, I don't think Doc Ellis was there, but someone from um, uh, from uh, from the board was there, yeah. and um, and uh, I was I was shocked because uh, the the doctor couldn't say anything uh, there because he was afraid of David O'Leary, so he didn't say anything about my pro- my problems. He just uh, you know said, okay, yeah, that's fine, okay. you know, and I I can understand him because. Uh, uh, David O'Leary would probably have uh, fired him or whatever if if he had been on my side. But I remember after that meeting at the Villa Park that I was uh, I was in shock. I cried a bit as well. I remember uh, because this this was completely wrong. Uh, but okay, I, I I stood by myself. I I I admit that okay, no one here is going to help me. I I have I just have to say stop myself. Uh, and then I found uh, that uh, guy in in, um, in Colorado, uh, Mr. Stedman, uh, who uh, who invited the uh, who in, in um, who found found this type of, uh, of of operation microfracture that I needed for for my knee. And uh, I said I want to go to him. I want to go to America. I have a big problem with my knee. Whatever you say, I cannot play anymore. I want to go to to Stedman. And okay, uh, we we did that. What was it like when you kind of finally stood up to David O'Leary and you had that conversation saying, "Look, what you're doing is 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 doing my body no good whatsoever." Did you have to feel? It seems like quite a brave move to make, even as an experienced player, to go and have that conversation with a manager. It was, and uh, I, I didn't like him. I didn't. I didn't like uh, David O'Leary. He brought me to the club, a club, and I'm thankful thankful for that. But. He wasn't. He wasn't a good person. He wasn't uh, wasn't nice to the other players as well. And uh, and for me, he could have ruined my my career. So I, I I wouldn't say that I hated him, but I didn't I didn't like him at all uh, because he was only thinking about himself. Um, but yes, it was tough. It was it was really tough. Uh, but but I just I just understood uh, that. He's going to ruin my career and I cannot have that. I'm 28 years old or whatever I was at that time uh, and I cannot have that. Uh, I have to play more and I have to accept that I have a bad knee injury and uh, I, have to, I have to take care of this. Um, so uh, I was strong, probably, yeah, I was, I was strong, but, uh, but I said, no, I stop now. I cannot take painkillers to train. I have a big problem. I need to fix it. So what was it like when you went over to Colorado? It's a long way to go. Did you travel on your own or how, how was that experience? No, it was fine. Uh, I had Alan Smith uh, with me. I believe he's still uh, at the club. Uh, great guy. Uh, obviously also scared uh, of uh, David O'Leary, but he, he, was a, he was a nice guy. He's a nice guy and uh, he helped me a lot. Uh, and we went we went over there together and uh, had a ch- uh, had a talk with um, Mr. Stedman and um, we did the operation and he was there with me uh, helped me and um, we went back uh, and I talked to him about okay where what 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 now uh, I have to do uh, rehabilitation for a year and I said I don't want to I want I don't want to do re- rehabil- uh, rehab uh, at um, uh, in Birmingham at Aston Villa because. I've seen uh, Redondo. I played with Fernando Redondo in uh, AC Milan, and he had a bad knee injury, and he went away. He went to uh, Argentina and uh, Madrid, 
away from uh, AC Milan because, like he said, if you're there, he, uh, the players will always come, how are you? Uh, you know, uh, are you okay? When are you going to play again? All in a good way because they care about you. But, but, but it's, it's annoying, it's irritating when, you know, when you're working and you have 20 players coming and always asking you questions and put a little bit pressure on you. So I decided, no, I want to go away. Just focus on the, on, on the rehab, be together with other injured players that doesn't, that don't, you know, uh, ask questions. So I went to Bologna and I was there for, for nine months. Very tough time, but uh, it was it was still great because I could only focus, you know, on on coming back uh, stronger than um, than ever. And Richard Stedman's the best in the business, isn't he? He is, yeah. He invited that. Uh, no, we're not invited. He found, you know, um, that uh, special technique that it is uh, a microfracture. Um, so, um, and like he said to me after the operation, it went well, uh, everything is well, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter anything if you don't do your rehab good. Uh, I give you 80% chance of coming back, but you have to do your rehab as good as you can, because otherwise it doesn't matter how good an operation it was. You have to do your rehab well. Uh, so I stayed very focused uh, in Bologna and I worked twice a day and um, I came back to Aston Villa and I felt really strong. Were there moments during the rehab where you thought it was going to be too tough, Martin? No, not really. I, I, I wanted to give it a chance because I remember I said to myself uh, that I couldn't look myself in the mirror, uh, mirror if it didn't uh, went out well. I, want to, I wanted to look myself in the mirror after and say, okay, I can accept that I cannot play football anymore, but at least you've done everything that you possibly could. Then I could accept. I could accept. I would have been sad and everything, but I could accept that I couldn't play football anymore. I couldn't accept that I couldn't play football anymore if I just, you know, uh, I don't want to do this. It's, it's too hard. And uh, okay, I, I'll have a day off or two days off or whatever. You know, then then I know with myself that my life would be would have been... You know, I, I, I would have to regret that every day in my life uh, if I didn't do that right. Um, and I understood that uh, at that time. And that, that was what helped me, you know, to really work hard to, to come back. Even though, even though probably uh, perhaps it, I couldn't come back, but I, I, I gave it a chance. So let's, let's take you forward to, to happier times, shall we say, when, when Martin O'Neill arrived. What's your, what's your favorite memory of Martin? Martin O'Neill loved me, you know. He uh, he he loved the 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 way I was uh, I was playing. He was just uh, a, I was just the kind of centre half that he he wanted in the team. The best thing he said to me, Martin O'Neill, was, "I understand that you cannot train as the others. I don't want you to train as the others. You can more or less do whatever you want Monday to Friday, but you have to be ready for Saturday and obviously play well." And that was just music in uh, in my ears because that that allowed me to do my own training um, uh, to to be ready to play match uh, on on the Saturday, uh, and and I knew that if I if I didn't if I didn't do anything Monday to Friday, I would probably also not play well on the Saturday. So I had to to train well Monday to Friday, but not actually train outside with the other ones because that would be too hard for my knee so i i was i was many times i had some days off uh, during the week where i did my i did my exercises in the in the gym i relaxed and uh, i did some special training for for my knee uh, and that allowed me to be ready to play match again one week after uh, on the saturday and that that was that was my best uh, memory of of him saying that What's his secret then, Martin? What does he? Uh, obviously, he had a very kind of relaxed approach and, and trusted you to kind of get yourself ready for for the weekend. But what about for the rest of the squad? What was his knack of of kind of getting people to run through walls for him? Martin O'Neill was uh, a great a great leader in the sense that um, that he he was a winner. You know, he was a winner. He didn't accept that we lost the game, even though we were not uh, Manchester United or whatever. It was always a catastrophe when when we lost the game. So that was that was you could feel that, and you didn't want it. You didn't want it to to 
to lose. Uh, you could lose, but you didn't want it to lose or to disappoint him. So you did everything that you possibly could because he's, he, he was after you and the whole team. We had meetings, you know, where we went through what happened there, whatever. He was angry, and he, it was not it was not nice. You didn't want it. You didn't want it that. You know, so you wanted to do everything that you could not to be in that situation on on the Monday morning. Uh, and then uh, another good thing with Martin O'Neill was that even though we didn't do a lot of uh, tactical train training, he wasn't he wasn't a, a great um, trainer. In that way that we did a lot of things, like I did with Ancelotti, uh, with AC Milan. Uh, okay, if uh, the right back has the ball, you're going to play that up there and you're going to run like this and, uh, you know, whatever. You didn't, you didn't talk about that. You, you just went out and, and did some, did some training. Um, because Saturday was the most important thing for him. Uh, but he was, he was, um, he was a, he was a winner and he, al- he also had, uh, a, a good idea of how to play. Even though we didn't practice a lot, you know, he wanted wingers. He wanted a big uh, striker in the middle. He wanted, uh, you know, uh, a type of game where you press and you work hard and you play the ball up to Ashley Young or Agban Lahore or into John Carew or whatever. He had he had a, a, a way of playing, you know, a, a, an idea of what what kind of players he wanted to play in the team and what kind of players he wanted to bring in and that was that was uh, that was good he was very focused and very concentrated and uh, we could all feel that and uh, uh, we ha- we had to win we had to win because we could see that it was uh, important for him can i take you to the 2007 2008 season which was obviously the season where i think it was probably certainly the best season of your villa career possibly the best season of your career full stop Definitely, definitely. Am I right in thinking that for most of the season it was either Olaf or Zach Knight who were your partners that that year? Yeah, uh, I believe that Olaf played a lot uh, right back uh, that year. So I played uh, many games with Zach Knight or Curtis Davis, as uh, I remember. Um, I played some matches with uh, Olaf as well, but I think believe that he played a lot of games as a, as a right back it was uh, it was a great season uh, funny enough uh, it, it it didn't start it that well i made an own goal uh, against liverpool uh, that season i was sick that day i was not feeling well uh, and it wasn't because uh, i made that own goal in the first half uh, <laughs> that that he took me off uh, martin o'neill it was because i i puked and uh, i i was very <laughs> Very sick in uh, at halftime. I said no. I cannot. I cannot play anymore. But but I wanted to play. Martin O'Neill wanted me to play uh, from the beginning uh, that day. So I I said okay, fine. I didn't want to miss that game. I'll try and see how it goes. But I wasn't feeling good. But after that game, everything went really well for me. What was your your favourite moment during that season, Martin? Uh, obviously, obviously, what comes in my mind. Um, are my goals, you know, and uh, probably uh, the most important goal, um, important, the, the one that I, I like the most was the, the winning goal against Tottenham, the 1st of January uh, 2008. We won 2-1 two, two, against Tottenham um, that day. And it, it, was so, it was so special for me because it was the 1st of January. It was the first day of the new year. And, and, that year, you can say that the the whole season uh, seven eight was 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 great, but but the whole two thousand eight was uh, was was great for me. And it started the first of January, you know, scoring that uh, winning goal five minutes from time uh, against the uh, Tottenham. So that's 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 the one that uh, that I remember with uh, with joy. Obviously, the the goal against Ajax was uh, was very special as well uh, for me. Am I right in thinking in that that year, that 2007-2008 year, didn't you score twice in a couple of 4-4 draws as well? Yeah. uh, No. Uh, I scored one uh, on Boxing Day um, against Chelsea and then I scored away from home against Tottenham 
two goals, but I only scored one uh, against uh, Chelsea when we that, when we played four four. That must have been a, a bit of a strange situation. Being pleased to score goals, but then being really frustrated to concede four goals. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was uh, especially the the Tottenham game. Uh, I think we were four. We were up four one or something like that. Uh, Whatever, but they scored um, a minute, a minute from uh, from the time you know from from when the the game ended, and that was a big, big disappointment. And Martin O'Neill was crazy, you know, after after that game. I remember, and I was also a little bit disappointed, you know, that my two goals wasn't enough uh, to win the match, obviously. Uh, but that was that was a little bit of a disappointment, yeah. Tell us a little bit about Zach Knight and Curtis Davis when you played alongside those two, because there were two players who came in at a very good time for Villa, but perhaps didn't go on to to make the you know to fulfil their potential at Villa. No, nice lads, both of them. I played. Uh, I had a good relationship with them. I played well with them. Uh, if it was Curtis Davis or Zach Knight, uh, more or less the same same type uh, of players. Uh, Zach Knight was really tall. Uh, Curtis Davis, uh, a little bit like like me, not not so not so good with the, with the ball, but uh, worked hard and was focused, concentrated, uh, good header of the ball. Uh, Sad Knight uh, was was not that quick, but he 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 understood where he should uh, you know place himself, um, and um, they were both uh, good players, and I, I enjoyed to play with both of them. You just mentioned briefly the, the goal against Ajax. Can you um, can you talk us through the, your memories of that night? Because I just remember Villa Park was absolutely bouncing that night. It was a special night. Uh, obviously, we knew that uh, it was a special night for Aston Villa, for the fans. Uh, they, they haven't been... Um, a European Cup game for many years at uh, Aston Villa and uh, Marco van Basten was uh, the manager of Ajax, a player that I looked up to um, and um, just Ajax was was the big big team coming to 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 us to Birmingham to play against us. Uh, the atmosphere was uh, something special from uh, the beginning. You could you could feel that. You can feel that when you come in to do your warm up. You can feel it even more when you go on to the pitch that this is this is a special night you get you get that feeling like when you play a team like like when you play a game for the national team you get that special feeling you know when you play a european cup game a champions league game or 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 a national team game uh, it's 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 special compared to when you play uh, a game in in the premier league and that was that was the thing that happened that uh, that night and then I was lucky uh, to um, to score that uh, goal, um, and um, it was uh, in front of the hold and um, and we we won the game at the end. I scored uh, the one nil, and then they scored, and then Gareth Barry scored, uh, and we won the game. And it was um, incredible night, incredible night. What's it like when you're on the pitch at Villa Park? And the whole ten's heaving with with so many people. What what does he? Because we only see the whole ten either because we're sat in the whole ten or because we're sat in another part of the stadium. But what does it feel like when you're actually witnessing it when you're out there on the field? I enjoyed it so much, and I was so proud in that period of time. Um, I could I could hear, I could feel that the fans liked me. They you know sang songs uh, during the game. Uh, when every time we got a corner or, or a free kick and I went up, you know, they're saying, uh, what's that coming out of defense? And, uh, you know, all, you know, it was, it was just so special uh, for me. And I enjoyed it incredibly much. Uh, I was so proud to be there on the pitch and I was so proud to hear my name, feel, uh, you know, the love from, uh, from the fans and it's still there. I came uh, some months ago to to Villa Park, and uh, they they said my name again. And uh, you know, when I was on the pitch there, uh, it's incredible that they still remember me, that they still love me. And I can only say that I'm I'm so so proud. You know, when I when I felt that as a player, and also after many years after, when I come to Villa Park, and they still still like me. I think they'll like you for many years to come. I can can assure you of that. Can I um 
Can I ask about Big John Carew? Because obviously Villa had that fantastic result, that fantastic European night against Ajax, and then all the headlines in newspapers like our newspaper and the, and the national newspapers are talking about Big John Carew being in a strip club. Does that is that just t- typical John? A little bit, yeah. A little bit. He, uh, you know, he he's he's a little bit uh, special in in a good way, you know, because uh, he was uh, many times in uh, in London uh, at these uh, fancy parties, and he showed us pictures every week. He showed us pictures uh, with uh, some girl that he's been with or met or or uh, like a famous person or whatever. I mean, he was he was single. John in the the whole whole period of time and he liked you know to go out to parties and uh, th- that was the that was the 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 way he he was and perhaps still is uh, that that was just the way he he is you know and um, fine uh, he wanted to live his life uh, like that I, I'm not that guy at all but uh, it was it was always fun to to see the pictures uh, you know after uh, some day. Some some nights out, you know, and um, he's he, he was a good guy. He is a good guy, John Carew. What did the players say to him the following day when he got himself in trouble? <laughs> they were just laughing, I think. <laughs> you know, typical typical you, John. <laughs> so it wasn't. Uh, he was uh, he was very appreciated with uh, with all the players, and they they obviously they they knew how what kind of person uh, he was. Uh, and they accepted that because he did great for us on the pitch. Uh, there were days, you know, where he was unstoppable. Uh, and then, then there were also games where he didn't do that much. Uh, but when he was at his best, John Carew, he was unstoppable. What was it like having to mark him in training, Martin? Very difficult. Very difficult. And uh, like I said, uh, it must have been very difficult for... Uh, for the other defenders that played against him, you know, because he was big and strong and defended the ball well and uh, had a good uh, touch on the ball, a good kick. Uh, very difficult to to win headers against him because he was so big and tall. Um, so on his good days, he was, like I said, really, really a handful. Can I ask you what your funniest moment was at Villa when you can just kind of recall somebody did something stupid in the training ground or told a joke or just just something that kind of had you had you creasing with laughter me and Olaf we 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 laughed uh, a lot uh, you know um, of what uh, Ashley Young and Akbanlahor did uh, they were crazy young young kids uh, at that time uh, did uh, nice 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 lads but you know did what they wanted and paid a lot of uh, fines you know for doing things that they didn't, uh, you know, had to do or whatever. So we laughed a lot, you know, um, of what they, of what they did, but I, I can't remember, I can't remember a special occasion, uh, that I, that I, that I have in mind more than others, but, uh, those two were, were very funny together, always joking and doing things together. And, uh, you know, just doing crazy things together. They were they were young, you know, at that time. And me and Olaf, we we were not like them, you know. Uh, probably not also as a, as a person, we were not like them. But we could still see the funny thing, you know, they did. Uh, it was just the way they 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 were, you know. Uh, they they were very individual and uh, creative, and you could see that on. On the pitch as well. When the injury came through, would it have been halfway through 2008, 2009? What was the what was the first sign that you got that that injury was back and that this time it kind of might be more trouble than before? I remember it like this, that uh, just before Christmas, we played a game and uh, I, got, I got problems with uh, my knee. I was out for the Christmas period. I cannot remember if I had a small operation there uh, on my knee, but uh, I know that I came back for the West Brom game uh, in the beginning of uh, of January uh, 2009. And uh, after that game and during the game, I didn't feel good at all during that game. But I trained um, well before the game uh, and I felt okay for the game. And then I played it. And it didn't feel good. And I said to Alan Smith after the game, 
this is not good. Uh, this is not good. My knee is not good. And then I believe that I went to, to London um, and had a small injury, a small uh, surgery or, or something. Uh, but I was out for, for some months during, my, uh, did my rehab. Um, and I remember that we went to Dubai in April or something. Uh, and I started to run more seriously uh and i did some football training and it flared up again uh my knee and it it didn't feel good so i had to decide more or less what to do then because i could i could see i could feel that my knee needed surgery again from uh from dr statman but he gave me only 50 50 uh chance of coming back because i i did some other things with my cartlets on the outside of uh, of my knee before that so my my right knee that was the problem now wasn't in a, in a good shape so uh, he couldn't give me a good chance of coming back it was it was more or less like 50-50 do you regret that you didn't didn't try and take that chance martin or is it something that you just have to get on and look at you know you've got a long life ahead of you after football do you think you made the right choice to to protect your kind of legs and your mobility going forward? It's very difficult because uh, many years after I, I stopped playing football, I said uh, that that was the that was the best decision uh, because because I was uh, I was feeling good after I didn't have I didn't have any problems. I could have a normal life, uh, play a little bit of football, you know, run, go up and down the stairs without having pain. But I don't know if it was uh, the right decision. Uh, I don't regret it, but uh, some days, some days, I, I, I can not regret it, but I can imagine me say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever I can to, uh, to, to come back uh, and uh, again. But no, I don't, I don't regret it. Uh, but obviously, it would have been nice to come back at 33 and perhaps play two or three more years. Uh, but, but I don't know if, 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 if it would have, you know, been like that. No, but what I'm, what I'm really sorry about is, is that it, uh, is that I, I got those problems because I was, I was in the shape of my life. Uh, when I had to stop, I played the best football of my career. So that was, that was what made me sad. Uh, and st- and still, I can I can see some football games and imagine me, you know, being there and uh, and um, and I would have loved to to have played more, but uh, at at that point and still now, I I'm happy with what I did. Uh, my career was good, but uh, three or four mi- four more years as a captain playing for Aston Villa would have been fantastic. Because I think you had a brief a brief spell uh, as a coach in Denmark. Is that still something you have the ambition to do to to become a coach or a manager? I like I I I love uh, being being a coach. Um, I uh, I I love to to stay with people. I love to be able to uh, give something on, you know, to uh, to to young kids or football players in in general. And it's right that. I took uh, I took a job in Denmark. Uh, I was there for eight months. It was a great experience. Um, then it didn't work out so well with uh, with the family. Uh, I started to to get my own kids at that time, um, and it was not easy for me to go away in the evening or the afternoon uh, from uh, from my wife and my small kids. Um, I had some problems, you know, with my wife ac- accepting, you know, that that I had to to do this. Uh, it, it was more or less for free, you know. I didn't get any money for it, so it was pretty pretty hard for me to go there. Uh, so I thought, you know, for the family situation <laughs> and the happiness of, uh, of of my wife and us together, that it was probably better to stop. Um, so I stopped, uh, now we live in Spain. Uh, I coach my, my, my kids, uh, and I feel a lot of enjoy doing that. 
obviously uh, there's still something in me that wants to that wants to do some something more you know uh, because I think that I have something to to bring as a as a manager as a, as a coach I've I've done a lot I I know things I can see things I like to to be with uh, with with people I like to to give advice uh, uh, so sometimes I can feel that I'm wasting some talent, uh, if if you understand. But but nothing is more important for me than than my family. That's that's the most important thing for me. So it's 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 a balance, you know, between having a happy family, but also doing the things that where I'm good, you know, doing the things that I like. And I, I wouldn't say that. If something comes on, I would I would consider it uh, because now my kids are seven, nine, and and fourteen, so they're becoming big, and we have a good life, and I have a good life. Uh, but but I wouldn't I, I would consider it if if uh, if something happens someday. So let's say 2030, and there's a vacancy at Villa Park for a new manager, Martin. What what, what would you make of that? <laughs> You know, uh, Di Matteo. Di Matteo, when he was uh, at Aston Villa, he actually uh, he actually phoned me and uh, and asked me if I if I would come. Uh, but it was it was too quick, and uh, I didn't I didn't uh, I didn't think that he was prepared enough of what I should do and uh, and things. Uh, but it, and it didn't went well for him. But um, but I, I I had a chance to come to Aston Villa. Uh, at that time, I didn't I didn't take it because I didn't think it was right at that time. But Aston Villa for me is my club. You know that's uh, that's where I have my heart. Uh, I can see that people like me. Uh, so obviously, if if I start doing something here, if I start to to prepare, you know, for 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 a big job, I would obviously consider Aston Villa if uh, if they needed me someday. Every time a manager sacked at Villa Martin, there's always the get get Martin in, get Olaf in. Be quite the, the the dream team, wouldn't it? If you and Olaf came back as a as a as a management duo, that would be something nice. Olaf 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 is having a a good career at the moment. He's he's done well as a manager uh, in a club uh, in Stockholm. Now he's with uh, Helsingborg in uh, in Sweden, and um, they couldn't start because of the this Corona thing. But uh, he's very serious uh, about uh, the football now, Olaf. Um, so uh, you never know. Maybe someday we'll come. Oh, I can't tease us like that. Um, can I just ask, what what are you? Well, I know what you're doing now because the whole world is in lockdown at the moment. So I presume you're not doing a great deal. But what is it? How how are you spending your time now, Martin? Is it is it family life? Is it the coaching of your kids? Do you do any kind of punditry or any work like that at the moment? No, um, we we decided to go uh, and live in Spain uh, two and a half years ago, just to to enjoy um, Spain, enjoy the the nice weather, enjoy some quality family time, and we have a we have a nice life here in uh, in in Spain and. Um, Obviously, I I need to do something as well. So I I coach my my two boys. Uh, so I have four trainings a week plus two games, which keeps me occupied. And I feel that I give something, and I stay with my kids, and uh, I enjoy the football training, and it's nice. Then obviously, uh, it's a golf paradise here. I play play also some some golf. But most, most of all, I'm I, I have a lot of time with my kids, and that's uh, the most important uh, thing for me. I don't do anything with the media uh, right now. Um, I did that a lot after I stopped playing football. But I've always felt that it was uh, it was the coaching thing that that I enjoyed uh, the most. Most not not speaking football, but uh, but uh, but coaching football. So so I I enjoy that more. So I wanted to do that uh, instead of speaking football, but but we are here and um, and uh, now it's uh, it's a complete lockdown here in Spain. It's a uh, it's very boring. We we have a, a garden where they can play some football and they can have some get get some air sometimes. But 
but there are families here in Spain that live in a very small apartment with uh, no chance of of coming out and uh, and it's very hard for for the families for the kids uh, in this in this time um, but but okay that's that's how it is uh, it's still locked down here until the the 9th of may mm-hmm. uh, so it's it's tough um, but we we are in a good situation uh, compared to many many other families obviously when you were coming when you were playing under martin o'neill a lot of your training would have been done indoors anyway so what what kind of advice would you give to to footballers who are trying to keep themselves ticking over on treadmills and 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 rowing machines and exercise bikes i suppose there's a different mentality about it isn't there yes and that's that's where you have to that's where you have to think because it's it can be it can be really hard to do your training if you don't have a purpose, if you don't, if you don't think about what, why am I doing this training? Where is it going to end? Uh, and, and the players that are in this situation have to think that I do this training so I can come back and, and be ready to, to play or not ready, but be in a good, good state, uh, be in a good situation so I can quickly come back and play well. Because you always have to think about, the more you do, the better it is. And that was that was the same thing that I did or thought when I was doing my rehab. That you you're not doing it for for the manager. You're not doing it for for your mother or father. You're doing it for yourself. You're doing it to to, to be be prepared uh, as good as you can to play well. So you you have to think about. I'm doing this for myself. I'm doing it so I can play well when I come back. And if you, you think about that, then I think you, 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 you train better. You come, you come through better and you, and you don't just lay on the sofa and say, Oh, I can't do it today. But you have to think, well, why am I doing this? So that's, uh, that, that's, that's, that's the best advice that I can give Aston Villa players or whoever is in, in this situation. Think about why you train. Why do you train? Train to to be prepared to play games and play play well again. I just hope that uh, people don't get more sick, you know, uh, than this virus. Uh, because I've heard things also from my close family, you know, depression, uh, stress, uh, you know, other things that can can happen when you're when you're in this situation, when you can when you cannot move, you don't know if you have a job, you don't know, you know, uh, you know, with the money, uh, all these all these things that are in your mind. Um, but my best is, advice is to stay stay positive. This will this will pass, and everything will be good again. Perhaps not not as normal as it was before, but it will be it will be good again. And I just hope that everyone in Birmingham and all the Aston Villa fans will take care of themselves and stay stay positive. I think we'd echo that to to you as well, Martin. You and your family, and make sure that you take care and, and stay safe as well. Can can I just finish off by giving you a quick Martin Lawson quiz? Five questions and see see what you can remember about your Villa career. Yeah. Right. Okay. Question number one. Who was your Aston Villa debut against and what was the score? Uh, Southampton uh, and we won uh, 2 nil. Correct. One out of one. Okay, question two. How many goals did you score during your time at Aston Villa? Uh, um, oh, I scored six that Premier League season. Ajax, uh, 10, 11. Ooh. Oh, 11. Yeah, I've got you down. Is it, According to Aston Villa's complete record book by Rob Bishop, you've scored 11. So we'll give you that. That's two out of two. Next one. How many appearances did you make for Aston Villa? Uh, I probably made something like 90. Oh, 91. Well, I think I'm going to give you that as well. That, that's pretty good. 91. So there are 89 starts and two substitute appearances. Question four. What was your transfer fee when you went from AC Milan to, to Aston Villa? Three million. Three million, correct. And the final one to get a full house, get five out of five. Who scored an own goal? It wasn't you against uh, Liverpool. Don't worry. Who scored an own goal in your final Aston Villa match against West Bromwich Albion? They, it was a West Brom player who scored it, so it was a goal that, that went towards Villa. Don't know. 
Oh, Scott Carson, that was your, your former, form, former teammate, Scott Carson. Well, four out of five, that's pretty good, isn't it? You've got a good memory. Not so, so bad. Can I just say you've been an absolutely brilliant guest, Martin. You've brightened us up. It's, uh, it's, a worrying, it's a weird and worrying world out there for a lot of people at the moment. But I know where Aston Villa fans are concerned that you're an absolute legend and you've, you've proved that on the pitch and you've proved that kind of off the pitch by being such a thoroughly good bloke as well. So I just want to say thanks for your time and, and wish you and your family all the best. Stay safe. Always a pleasure. Stay safe. Cheers, Bye. Martin. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode. Until then, up the villa.